The Oklahoma City Thunder get their final four-game homestand started out right with a loss to the Atlanta Hawks. Trey Young goes off, but his high school teammate, Lindy Waters, breaks out. What does it mean for the future of the Thunder that Olivier Saar played well in this game? And where do the Thunder go from here after playing with only eight active players as Trey Mann is held out again due to a hamstring injury? All of that and more coming up on today's Lockdown Thunder podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Our Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on today's Locked On Thunder podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, your teams every day. I'm your host, Rylan Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Rylan underscore Styles. You can follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunder Pod. Email the show, LO Thunder Pod at gmail.com. On today's show, we're going to dive into the Oklahoma City Thunder losing to the Atlanta Hawks 136 118. Trey Young drops 41 points. Lindy Waters scores 25. Everybody but two players. Drop double figures, and for a moment there, Oklahoma City was lob city in this game. The game overview is simple. Not really. SGA, out for the season. Josh Giddy out for the season. Lou Dort, out for the season. Darius Baisley, out for the season. Mike Muscala, out for the season. Ty Jerome, out for the season. Now, Kenny Hustle and Derek Favors were both out, but we haven't heard officially They're out for the season. However, it would be pretty odd that the Thunder have given us no updates on them, despite being asked. And it'd be odd for them to come back for the final six games or or however many many games are going to be left after they eventually come back. I just can't see them ramping back up for this season. So for all intents and purposes, you can count Kenny Hustle and Derek Favors is out for the season. And then, before tip-off, Trey Mann was listed as questionable with that hamstring injury that held him out against Portland earlier this week. Yeah, he didn't play either, out with the hamstring injury. That left the Thunder with eight active players. One of those eight active players was Jeremiah Robinson Earl, who's back off of a broken bone in his foot as a big man, and he's restricted to about 15 minutes per game. Let's just say the Thunder did not have a ton of depth in this one at all. The Hawks were without Jalen Johnson, Gallinari, Thunder Legend, John Collins, Sharif Cooper, Skylar Mays, and Gorgie Jang. But the Thunder start out with Taylor Maldon, Vidkrechi, Aaron Wiggins, Poku, Roby. The Hawks start out with Trey Young, Kevin Herter, DeAndre Hunter, TLC, Thunder Legend, and Clint Capella. So how did the Thunder end up losing this game? Well, Trey Young simply went off for 19 first quarter points, a first quarter career high for Trey Young. 41 points on 54% shooting from the floor, 33% from deep. Six Hawks had double figures, including Kevin Herter, Bogdanovich, Young. They all had 20 plus. And then DeAndre Hunter and Kevin Knox had 19 and 17, respectively. After the game, Trey Young said, quote, I always tell people I represent Norman, my family, and the city on my back every time I play. And he says he does not get this warm welcome back in every arena. Obviously, he's famous for having that huge uh, spat with the with the Knicks crowd in the playoffs, and obviously he's a player that can rub the opposing crowd the wrong way. However, there's a special connection between Trey Young and Oklahoma, obviously, because he's from Norman, went to Norman High, went to OU, and he was always going to have that bond with the Thunder, Oklahoma City, and the state, which always begs the question, could we see Trey Young in a Thunder uniform eventually? Look, it's night like this. It's a night like this where you have eight active players and half of them, I'm sorry, folks, I know that we all build these incredible emotional connections to these players. Half of them are not going to be in the NBA in a couple of years, are not going to be on the Thunder in a couple of years. So let's just let your mind wander for a second about what might happen is you know if the Thunder land a top pick in this draft and hit that top pick in this draft. And then they have, let's just say, Jabari Smith and Josh Giddy and SGA. And then... Trey Young has another little weird spat with the Hawks like he had last year. And he decides, you know what? I want to go back home. 
I want to go play for the Thunder. And then you just have this weird collection of blue chip players like a Trey Young, like a SGA, like a Josh Giddey and Jabari Smith. How does that all fit together? I don't know. But you know what? I'm not going to turn down an NBA All-Star after what we just saw today on the basketball floor. I'm not, I'm not in that kind of headspace right now. So what a brilliant way to let your mind wander on this Thursday morning and thinking about Trey Young in a Thunder uniform, dropping 41 points at the Paycom Center every single night. What a wonderful world that would be, huh? Look, obviously, that's a pipe dream, never going to happen. Might happen, but probably not going to happen. We don't want to get our hopes up again, but let's move on. The Hawks dominate this game from start to finish. They made 18 threes. They went 20 for 22 at the free throw line, and the Thunder shot 27 free throws, but only made 19. The Thunder had 17 three-pointers made, six in double figures, two with nine points. The Hawks got up to by 34 points and simply never looked back in this game. This game was never tied. There was never a lead change. And the Thunder were blown out from start to finish. Letting the Hawks go on like a 14 to two run to start this game. Uh, and then they made a few runs to get it down to, you know, 20 or, or down to 15, but they never could tie the game up or take the lead, which puts the Thunder on a one game losing streak, two and eight in their last 10 games, two and a half games back of Detroit and of Houston and Orlando. Houston and Orlando, are tied for the top odds. Detroit is a half game back of that group. Detroit's lost three straight. Houston's lost two straight. And Orlando has lost four straight games. Can the Thunder climb up these two and a half games? Probably not. Their next game is against Detroit, so you can make up that game, you know, in a sense. You can make up a game by letting Detroit beat you. But then you play the Suns, who, you know, who knows what they have to play for at that point. Portland, we saw how hard it is to lose to Portland on Monday, and then Utah Lakers Clippers. The good thing is Utah keeps you know spiraling, so they're going to need that game for standing purposes and for you know matchup purposes. So Utah's going to play hard, but the Lakers at that point legitimately might be out of the playing contention and out of the playing conversation. Just pack it in. That's how bad the Lakers are right now, and the Clippers just got bad Paul George. So again, another feather in the hat for the Thunder, or another positive sign for the Thunder as the Clippers get back. Paul George. I don't think the Clippers will sit him down and not let him get into a groove. Now, granted, they have to play in the play-in, so maybe they do, but that is an 11 a.m. game uh, Central Time, according to Tankathon, which I, I don't think that that can be right because if it's 11 a.m. Central Time, that's a 9 a.m. game in L.A. I think that that's still to be determined, and they just kind of put a filler time in there. But nonetheless, that's a game that the Clippers might need for the play-in, and also you still want to work back in Paul George as much as you can, so I don't think that uh, Paul George will sit, therefore – a lot harder game for the Thunder to win, so that helps the tank as well. But the Thunder currently sit at four, probably going to stay there for the entire cycle. You know, probably going to be there on lottery night, and then we'll just see if this is the year number four jumps into the top three or gets the top overall pick. So we'll just see what happens with that. Coming up, though, we're going to dive more into how the Thunder lost this game and Lindy Waters' breakout performance. What does this all mean? How do you judge this team as they're playing with eight active players and in the middle of this uh, tank-a-thon type of season that you're kind of still blurred on what anything means at this point? But let's continue this show after we talk about our good friends over at Top Shot. NBA Top Shot is incredible, folks. It's the officially licensed NFT of the NBA. You can connect with a passionate community of NBA fans across the globe and build your collection with your favorite moments from NBA history. NBA Top Shot is the future of what being an NBA fan looks like. It's part trading card, part stock market, part fantasy sports with a built-in loyalty program. NBA Top Shot has evolved trading cards, and they make it easier to buy, sell, and trade by removing the hassle of card grading, of shoeboxes, of binders. Their 24-7 peer-to-peer marketplace lets you scroll through all your favorite players and teams all at once. Once you find the moment you've been looking for, you can buy it in a couple of clicks. Now, I hear all the time, why would I buy something I can watch on YouTube for free? And I tell those people, it's not about watching a highlight. It's about having ownership in the stock, the market of NBA greatest moments. And owning NBA Top Shot moments can get you access to unbuyable once-in-a-lifetime experiences. For example, last year, NBA Top Shot pulled out a group of fans to Phoenix for Game 5 of the NBA Finals just for having Phoenix Suns moments in their collection. That's all they had to do. They had Phoenix Suns moments in their collection, and they got flown out by NBA Top Shot to Game 5 of the NBA Finals. The following week, Top Shot flew out a group of fans to New York for the NBA Draft. These collectors 
got to have dinner with four future first round picks the night before they were drafted and also play basketball with New York, New York Knicks player Obi Toppin. If you sign up for Top Shot today, the best way to start is getting yourself a starter pack. You can pull a moment of a superstar like LeBron or KD or stars of tomorrow like Cade Cunningham or Josh Giddy for $9. So head over to LockedOn.NBATopShot.com to start building and collecting your experiences today. LockedOn.NBATopShot.com. LockedOn.NBATopShot.com. We are back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast. On the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. I am your host, Rylan Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Rylan underscore Styles. You can follow the show on Twitter at LOThunderPod. And you can also email the show. Hello, Thunderpod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to Locked on Thunder, making your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. Subscribe for free across all platforms. It's absolutely free to subscribe anywhere you get podcasts from. For your second listen, go check out the Lockdown Now podcast, a nightly recap show of every NBA game with breakdowns from our local experts. It's free and available across all platforms wherever you get podcasts from. So go check it out. Lockdown Now, the Lockdown NBA YouTube page, or the Lockdown Now podcast feed. Let's continue this game with the Hawks and the Thunder in this tanking battle for the century for the Thunder. For the Hawks, of course, they're still playing for the play in the East, and they've kind of locked that spot up a bit, but still seeing where they're going to fall in the grand scheme of things. The Thunder had six double figures, two with nine. The Hawks got up 34 points and never looked back. The Thunder turned the ball over 18 times. The Hawks had 12 turnovers. The Thunder lost points in the turn, uh, points off of turnovers, 22 to 16. The Thunder were out-rebounded by just one rebound. Thunder lost points in the paint, 50 to 44. The Thunder won second chance points, 9 to 5. The Thunder lost fast break points, 18 to 7. And they outscored Atlanta, 51 to 42. The Thunder shot 47% from the floor, 41% from three, and 70% at the line. The Hawks shot 53% from the floor, 46% from three, and 90% at the line. And the big things was Lindy Waters. That was the biggest thing from this game for the Thunder. Look. During this conversation about Lindy Waters, you have to separate, you know, not fact and fiction. What's another way to say that without the fact and fiction part? You celebrate the human element from it, from the from the kind of business element of it. From a human perspective, I think if he would have told Lindy Waters a year ago he'd be playing 32 minutes in an NBA game, he would have called you crazy, he would have laughed at you. Now, I know that these athletes have supreme confidence, and you have to have supreme confidence to get where you want to go. And you always have to believe in yourself and believe in your abilities because the difference in Lindy Waters and another rotational piece around the NBA, not that great. It's not that wide of a gap. It's just about getting your shot and finding the right environment for you because all these guys are extremely talented. But still, you take a guy from Norman North to Oklahoma State to the semi-pro league in Edmond to trying out for the blue, making the blue team, working up the blue to a two-way deal and then playing 32 minutes a night, that roller coaster of a ride, you tell him about that a year ago, probably laughs in your face. So it is objectively cool that Lindy Waters comes out here and has a great game and makes seven three-pointers. There's nothing you can say other than, wow, Lindy Waters, what a cool story for this guy in his you know, hometown, so to say. I know he's from you know Norman North or whatever, but you know playing for the Thunder – in the state he grew up in, getting his NBA chance and flourishing for seven three-pointers made, 53% from three. So he's not just jacking them up there. He's making his shots. 25 points, playing against his high school teammate. How many times, you know, how many games of high school basketball did you play? I mean, I mean, did you play high school basketball? Of all the teammates in the world that you've ever had in high school basketball, how many played in the NBA? The odds are very small. Much less that both of you are going to play in the NBA, especially in Norman, Oklahoma. Let's call a spade a spade. Norman, Oklahoma, Oklahoma in general, while the high school basketball scene is getting better, is not the breeding ground for pro players like other places are in the United States of America. So the odds of this happening are very, very small. And we can acknowledge how cool this is. Now, what does it mean moving forward? What does it mean for the future? What does it mean for Lindy Waters? That's still up in the air. But he had the cool lob passes, obviously. He had the seven main three-pointers. He goes nine for 15 from the floor, four rebounds and assists, a steal, two turnovers, three fouls, 25 points. I think Lindy Waters 
can be a legitimate rotational player in the NBA, not a superstar, not a star, not a starter, but somebody who matters and somebody who plays in the playoffs, you know, whenever, and I use that, I use that marker because in the playoffs, your rotation typically shrinks to eight players, maybe nine, but typically eight players is what you're at in the playoffs. Can you be a top eight player in your team in terms of impact, in terms of play style, in terms of helping your offense? Absolutely. And the Thunder clearly invested in him and, and invested in his upside because they gave him that two-year, two-way deal. Again, the Thunder did not just throw around two-way deals. The Thunder did not just kind of give them out willy-nilly and not care about them. The Thunder take pride in two-way players, and they try to develop them, and they try to give them a path to the NBA club full-time. And so to expend a two-year, two-way deal, you're, you're taking one of your two two-way spots away from whoever goes undrafted this year in the draft. And there's always somebody who... You and I are very, very high on entering the draft that just simply doesn't have a home after Mark Tatum reads off the 60th pick. And the Thunder have tried to capitalize on that. Sometimes it's worked out greatly, Lou Dort. Sometimes it's flamed out, Josh Hall. But they try to capitalize on that, and now they only have one spot to utilize because they're tied into Lindy Waters. But it's clear that if Lindy Waters can take this offseason and can develop defensively, he can be an incredibly you know, important piece to an NBA team as a three and D type player with an ability to expand his offensive game because he's more athletic and because he also has better ball handling and vision to, if you're going to run off the three point line, you can take a dribble in, shoot from the mid range or get to the rim or find the open man as you're starting to rotate defensively to him. So Lenny Waters can really be an NBA player uh, in this league. And, and that investment that the Thunder have shown in him is legit. I do want to talk about Olivier Saar. He played more power forward in this game as he did last game. And look, the stats are nice. 17 points, one for three from three, nine rebounds, two assists, a block, only two turnovers. But I'd caution anyone to buy into Olivier Saar. From the moment he was signed to a two-way deal, I told you he has no NBA trait. He has no NBA prospect, no NBA hopeful, right? Not an NBA hopeful for the long term. And the reason is you're seeing it. It's really bad hands. He's not mobile enough to play in the modern NBA. And if you're starting to buy into Lene Sar, I'd remind you, number one, somebody has to do something when you only have eight players available. Number two, look at Moses Brown, who put up better numbers than Olivier Sar, who looked better than Olivier Sar, and has now bounced around to the Celtics, the Mavericks, to the Cavs, and, and is just unplayable in the NBA. And even a year ago, I told you that, that Moses Brown's career path would not be a starting center, much to the pushback of a lot of the audience. And he'd not even be a top-tier rotational piece. He'd be a, bo a Boban. A mismatch that you can throw in there as a wrinkle for five minutes in a game. Or even in a playoff series as Rick Carlisle did with Boban last year. But that's it. And that's been proven right. Levy Sar is not an NBA player. As much as he tries hard, as much as he plays good for the Thunder, I would just caution you if you're getting overly excited about Levy Sar's future in the NBA. Because I don't think he has one right now. And we'll see where he goes from here. Coming up, though, let's talk Tail Maldon. Should you buy back into Tail Maldon? Isaiah Roby plays well as well uh, again. And I, and I think that Aaron Wiggins shows you a lot about who he's going to be in the future in this specific game. That's all coming up on today's show. But first, I want to say right now, better good friends over at Bet Online. Bet Online is for you. It's awesome, folks. After months of playing and months of games, basketball has determined the top teams for the Final Four and will determine this year's national champion in the coming week. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all things betting needs and info. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, you name it, BetOnline remains the best spot for all your latest sports developments, including podcasts and reviews of all the leagues this season. It's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all sports wagering information and needs, including live betting and even Vegas casino games. So head over to the website today and even use your mobile device and check out the trends in action. BetOnline is where the game starts. And folks, this is how easy it is. You go to betonline.net, go to their sports book, and in a matter of moments, I can click on basketball, go to NCAA men's basketball future prop bets, and let's just see, right? Let's just see who we can bet on in the tournament. You've got... The odds to win it all. Duke is the favorite, plus 145. Kansas is plus 180. I'm hammering Kansas to win it all. I, I think that they're going to get it done. Now, you can also pick the highest 
points scored by any player in the Final Four? Will any player have over 21 points in one game? Will they at all? You can also bet what will be seen first on the broadcast. The Mario Chalmers shot to send the game to overtime. Many people think it won Kansas the national title. No, it sent Kansas to overtime. Will that highlight be played first or will the Villanova national championship highlight be played first? Which one will be played first on the broadcast? I'm again going to bet Mario Chalmers is played while they're doing the intro to the broadcast, much less once the broadcast starts. My favorite though is NCAA tournament most outstanding player. And I think Christian Braun of Kansas has a, a ton of value at plus 2,200. I think he's going to be raining down threes and therefore going to shock the world and win this award. Also, Remy Martin at plus 1,000 is great value. He's been on a tear this tournament. So make sure you go check it out today at betonline.net. We are back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast. On the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. I want to tell you right now, my good friends over at Lockdown NBA, folks, for your second listen, go check them out. They're covering the biggest stories from around the NBA in 30 minutes or less. And again, thank you for making Lockdown Thunder your first listen every single morning. Every single day, we'll hear for you talking better basketball. Make sure you subscribe for free across all pl uh, platforms and follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore styles. Now, let's continue talking about this Thunder team and let's move on to Sam Aldon, who's making the case for you not to give up on him yet. And I know that after these good games here, you're going to say, I never gave up on him. I never backed down on Tam Albon. Eh, I, I think that if we kind of dig back into your brain and think about what you thought a month ago, probably ready to give up on him. And we've seen at Mavs Draft on Twitter, R Richard Seaman come on this podcast and say that Tam Albon's the worst player in the NBA, statistically. So there was reason to give up on him. And we don't want to fall into the trap of, again, with only eight plays available, somebody has to play good. But he does have 18 points, eight assists, four rebounds, a steal, 57% from the floor, 33% from three. He really worked the paint well against Atlanta. He blew past Alon Wright, which is not easy to do. Alon Wright's a good defender. Um, he scored over the outstretched arms of Kevin Herter and uh, and Kevin Hunter, uh, or I should say DeAndre Hunter and Kevin Herter. And he had a three right in the face of uh, Trey Young. He was really good in the paint tonight. He had really good pace about him. I liked what we've seen from, from Tam Aldon. I do wonder how much it translates once he kind of balances into a new role, right? No longer a starter, no longer playing bulk minutes, no longer getting, to, and getting into a rhythm. What does this all mean moving forward? I wonder, but I think that, that you know, Maldon should breathe easy knowing that he's going to have another chance next year, I think, and he's not going to get thrown into some wacky trade. In my opinion, of course, Sam Presti could pull the fast one and we just never know. Isaiah Roby, another nice 14-point game, nine rebounds, two assists, a block, two turnovers, 42% from the floor. I still think Roby's very expendable. Uh, because you have Jeremiah Robinson Earl, and maybe this stretch here uh, has made teams take notice of Isaiah Roby and, and want him moving forward this offseason, but we'll see where the Thunder land. The biggest takeaway besides Lindy Waters and besides talking about Saar, I think is Wiggins. I think that Aaron Wiggins kind of showed you exactly who he is in this game, and that sounds crazy. How in the world can you have a, a takeaway at all from a, a game in which you're playing with eight players and the team is 22 and 54, and it just doesn't matter at the end of the regular season? That's precisely the point. Because Aaron Wiggins had every right with eight players available, one on a 13 or 15 minute restriction to just throw caution to the wind and do whatever he wants to do. But still, he was very reserved. He's a very conservative player. He was very by the book. He did everything technically sound. He made the right decision, right? He played within himself. He just did everything right. Like you can't really criticize a single play from him that was like, oh, that's not the right basketball move. And so it results in only 13 points and four rebounds and three assists. He goes one for three from three. But that's who Wiggins is going to be. A seventh, eighth man that you can count on to not mess up. Now, can his defense in the passing lanes get you a clutch steal to win the game? Sure. Can he have a night where he shoots and buries four threes? Sure. But in general, night to night, what you can average out to be is that, Taylor, is that Aaron Wiggins is going to not lose you games. And there is value in that. There is certainly value in, in a player just simply not throwing games away. And Wiggins is never going to have this superstar breakout, but he is going to be a very reliable 3 D player. And I ask you again, how many Thunder teams in the past could have gotten over the hump, could have been a lot better had they just simply had a reliable player in the second unit that would not throw the game away? That would be a nice 3 and D player. 
The bet of the day was Atlanta minus 13. That obviously cashed in in a big way. The money ball pick was a bit critchy. That did not work. But if you had Lindy Waters, you win with seven. And that's why Lindy Waters is my MVP of the game. Coming up tomorrow, we're going to talk to Richard Stamen of Mavs Draft and talk all about the NBA Draft Final Four, preview it all, and look back on my NBA Draft profile and projections from last year on Josh Giddy and Trey Mann and see what I got wrong, what I got right, what I would change moving forward, and all that fun stuff. So until then, tomorrow, be good and be good to one another.